what better time to really, you know, think about stress and, it, you know, when I'm personally going through quite a bit of it myself. So anyway, I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful to all of you um, for showing up today and uh, to talk about stress, to talk about the good, the bad and the ugly sides of it and um, to talk about how we can build more resilience for it. All right. So starting with a little pop quiz here, and uh, you don't have to answer in the chat box or anything, but just ask yourself this question. Who do you think has more stress? Well, nobody right now, because nobody's showing. There we go. Uh, this lady or this lady? And like any good pop quiz, it's a trick question, right? Because what we're seeing is really the response to stress, not necessarily the stressors themselves. Um, in reality, we actually have no idea how many outside stressors each of these people is experiencing. And so, you know, we're always told we need to reduce our stress, right? Um, but what does that mean? And is that even realistic? Um, because if you're living, if you're experiencing life, you're experiencing life events. And those life events are stressors. Um, there were a couple of psychiatrists, Holmes and Rahi, who assigned weights to different various life events um, in terms of how much stress they caused people in general. And things that you would expect, you know, death of a spouse, uh, injury or illness, death of a family member, certainly divorce, you know, cause stress. But what I'd like to point out is that even things that we think are pleasant experiences are things that could maybe reduce our stress actually can cause stress. Things like vacation, um, you know, marriage, a new child, retirement, you know, how many of us think, oh, well, when we retire, we'll have a stress-free life. Not going to happen. And, you know, so in viewing this, there's life events that cause stress, but is that always a bad thing? You know, are there any beneficial aspects of stress? Well, we know that in an acute stressor, you know, can cause our catecholamines to surge, um, which can lead to more blood flow to the heart and the muscles, um, expand, you know, dilate the bronchioles so that we can get more oxygen, basically do everything in this, you know, to help us run from the bear or the lion. And, um, you know, this is that fight or flight response, the sympathetic that we talk about. And so there, there are some benefits from that. Um, additionally, there were two psychiatrists or psychologists, Yerkes and Dodson, and they discovered through um, actually exper experimenting on mice that a certain amount of stress actually increases performance. Um, the mice were able to remember things more easily if they had some stressors. Um, and this was particularly true for simple tasks. For difficult tasks, there's kind of a sweet spot. You want a certain amount of stress to maximize your performance, too little or too much, and, and it's not you know, as good. Since then, um, human studies have validated some of this, although the, the results are sometimes mixed. But you know, nevertheless, we know that, um, at least from an evolutionary standpoint, Point, there can be some, you know, potential benefits from stressors. So when does it become harmful? Well, I like this study because it shows uh, back in 2009, um, they looked at people's different responses to stress. And this was to a single traumatic event like 9-11 or a uh, natural disaster. And what they found is that people in general landed in one of four categories. Ideally, we'd like to see ourselves in that resilience category. So stressor occurs, stress happens, but then the person within a reasonable amount of time is able to come back to baseline or even below their baseline and, and just builds from it, learns from it. Um, resistance, same type of thing. Maybe it takes a little bit longer to get there, but they get there. And then there are these other two groups one with a prolonged recovery phase, and then those who just 
experienced chronic stress. They stressed and they never really came back down from it. And these are the people that are more prone to like PTSD. And so this begs the question, right? What makes some people more resilient to stress? But before we go there, let's talk about, you know, why is that chronic stress so bad? Well, we know that chronic stress is associated with many, many different conditions that affect all aspects of our health. And this is not a complete list by any means, but it basically can make any existing condition flare up or worsen, or even expose a condition that may have been simmering under the surface. And so getting back to what makes one more resilient to stress. Well, over the years, various psychologists and psychiatrists have done a lot of studies and tried to answer this question. And there are many factors at play, but there are some common denominators that we can pull out. And these are some of them. For instance, um, people with supportive relationships tend to be more resilient to stress. And I'd like to point out that those supportive relationships don't necessarily have to be, you know, a spouse or a partner or a family member. It can be a therapist. It can be an online chat group. Um, so there are many different ways to, to form those supportive relationships. Um, finding purpose can promote resilience. Um, something that can sometimes promote that, that finding a purpose can include volunteering with those that are less fortunate. And there are people that, who are able to accept, refocus, reframe the situation in ways that um, create less stress for them overall. And all of these, you know, obviously could be like a subject of further discussion, right? But what I wanna focus on is this low level of anxiety because what it's found is that if you have a low level of baseline anxiety, you can tend to be more resilient to stress as it comes along. And so how can we do that? Well, in order to gauge what our baseline is, it's important to recognize the signs, symptoms, and behaviors of stress. And I'm not gonna read each one of these, but I'm just gonna give you a few moments to look over this list and think about what resonates with you. Which of these feelings or symptoms have you experienced or maybe are experiencing right now or have, you know, recently? And when we do recognize those signs, symptoms, or behaviors of stress or anxiety, what are some tools that we can use in the moment and on a day-to-day -day basis? So we want to be able to address things in the moment that is happening, but we also want to build up habits that build up long-term resilience. And let's start with mindfulness because of all the levers that we can apply in improving our health, I believe that mind-body medicine is one of the most powerful. And the field of mind-body medicine has just been exploding over the last few decades. But the more we learn, the more we realize how much our mental state affects our physical health, both negatively and positively. So I think that you know, most people at this point would agree that yes, stress leaves us more open to infection and disease, but how many people really buy into the fact that a positive state of mind can heal the body or, you know, make positive changes? And what we're finding is that that is true. But mind-body medicine can be so incredibly powerful in handling anxiety and day-to-day -day stress. And what I wanted to do, you know, there's so many exercises out there and, and tools available, but what I wanted to do is give just a few, you know, really useful, easy tools that can be used in the moment. And we're going to we'll spend a little bit of time talking about this. And so the first one is incredibly simple, but very effective. 
Um, and it basically brings you into the moment. Mindfulness is all about being in the moment, becoming the observer and being in the moment. And so just by stopping and asking yourself the question, isn't it interesting that I'm feeling irritable, right? Isn't it interesting that I'm feeling tense? Isn't it interesting that I'm feeling angry? Whatever it is, fill in the blank. And what that does in that moment is it causes you to step back from being the person who's actually experiencing and feeling to an observer of the person experiencing it, which is the key to mindfulness. And then you can take it even one step further. And once you identify that, whatever you're feeling, you ask yourself, can I be with that? So isn't it interesting that I'm feeling irritable? Can I just be with that? Can I just be with the fact that I'm feeling irritable right now? There's no judgment. There's no resisting. There's no trying to change it. There's no you know, saying, well, I shouldn't be feeling this way. I, I need to be feeling that way. I need to be feeling more positive. It's just simply observing and accepting. And it's incredibly powerful. Breathing exercises. I know we all talked about and heard about, you know, focusing on the breath. Um, that can be very difficult sometimes, especially if you're feeling very tense, if you have a lot of worries and concerns, if your mind is, is going a, a million miles a minute. And so a couple of uh, techniques that can help with this, um, one is timed breathing. Um, so some of you may already be familiar with this, but it's simply inhaling for four counts. And you can even do this with your fingers to keep your mind active. <laughs> Holding at the top for seven, you count out seven. And then exhaling slowly for eight. And you do that four times. And then you get back to whatever you're doing and you feel more centered. Another one that I really like is alternate nostril breathing. This is an Ayurvedic slash yogic technique. Um, again, it gives your mind something a little bit more to concentrate on. Um, I'm going to show it right now. You're welcome to join me uh, if you'd like. But you just sit comfortably. You take your right hand. You're taking your thumb and your ring finger. And take your thumb, cover up your right nostril, breathe in. Take your ring finger, cover it, breathe out. Stay there, breathe in. Switch, breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Always end on an exhale. It just takes a few seconds, and I always love demonstrating it because <laughs> I, I always feel a little more centered after I do that. You know, it just really ha has a way of balancing the autonomic system. So that's one of my favorites, and I recommend that often to many of my patients. And then guided meditations um, can be incredibly effective in the moment. If you have five minutes, if you have a smartphone, um, you can use uh, an app. I, I really like Insight Timer. It's a free app and it has literally thousands of guided meditations, talks, um, calming music. You can also use it at night when you're trying to go to sleep. Um, the quality varies, but you can bookmark the ones you like and uh, it's, it can be incredibly effective. So let's talk about another really powerful lever in our overall mental and emotional health, and that's nutrition. And zinc, magnesium, B vitamins, omega-3 fatty acids, these have all been shown to help reduce general anxiety. Vitamin C and panathetic acid are the key nutrients for the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are responsible for putting out the cortisol, which is your stress hormone. And so adding plenty of fresh leafy greens that are high in minerals and with these vitamins and nutrients um, definitely can help um, with generalized anxiety over time. Um, healthy nuts, seeds, and oils. And then if there's one food to eliminate, uh, 
that to help with long-term stress resilience? It would be, yeah, you guessed it, <laughs> sugar. Um, and I know it's hard because when we're under stress, our body craves sugar and salt. It's, you know, the, the, the effects of the hormones, but uh, in the long run, it, it doesn't help um, to build our resilience. So healthy sleep habits, we all know that inadequate sleep can contribute to health issues, but certainly it can contribute to anxiety, depression. Um, it can also just as a side note, increase your risk of dementia, heart disease, and other conditions. Um, so good sleep is very vital. Um, some things that can help with that, no late night eating, try to finish eating before 7 p.m. Try to have a regular bedtime somewhere around 10 p.m. You know, the Ayurvedics believe that, uh, you know, between 10 and two is kind of your, your um, prime sleeping time. So if you're missing out on that, um, could be detrimental. And start winding down around 9 p.m. If 10 p.m. is your is your uh, bedtime, start dimming the lights, um, get away from the screens if you can. And then if you're one of these people that can lie awake and just worry, and you know as soon as you lie down, the, the mind starts going, oh, I got to do this, I got to do that. Keep a notebook by your bed and just write it down, you know, stream of consciousness. Don't worry about grammar, spelling, whatever. Just get it down and leave it there. Minimize caffeine and alcohol. Both of these can disrupt sleep. Um, I don't know that people realize that even coffee drink that is taken in the morning, uh, that caffeine can still be there at the end of the day. And especially if you're a slow metabolizer, um, so if you do drink coffee, you know, try to keep it to just one cup early in the morning and, uh, that can help with sleep. If you do want to try some melatonin, I would try a very small amount, you know, three milligrams is kind of the standard dose out there, but that research has shown that that's way more than we need. And that sometimes less is more with the melatonin. So 0.5 milligrams. I like the liquid ones, um, that you just, you know, can put in, uh, dissolve in the mouth, um, and just recognize that it's probably not for long-term use. There are some people that can have side effects from continuous long-term use, like, you know, headaches or irritability. So take a break from it now and then just kind of use it sparingly. Healthy movement. I purposely did not say working out or exercise because I think, you know, so many of us, we, we often think that we have to work out, you know, um, and it needs to be like 45 minutes to an hour. What's the point, you know? And so I'm going to challenge you to change your perspective on this. And especially I'm talking to people who are prior athletes, current athletes, um, type A, you know, hard driven people. I want you to change your perspective of movement as being not necessarily, you're not trying to create physical endurance. This is a mental emotional exercise, right? Five minutes of movement can do wonders. So short intermissions throughout the day, because we all are very, very busy, but set a timer on your phone, 55, 60 minutes, take five minutes, stretch, do some, you know, sun salutations, um, walk, do some push-ups, whatever makes you happy. Um, but try to do it multiple times throughout the day. Herbal supplements can sometimes help with anxiety as well. Um, there are these herbs called adaptogens, and I really like um, these three, holy basil, maca, and ashwagandha for anxiety. Um, what adaptogens do is they help modulate the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Um, think of them as um, agents that help support the body's ability to accommodate different, um, you know, varying situations, varying physical and emotional stresses. Um, holy basil is used a lot in Ayurvedic medicine. It's been shown to increase endurance, help reduce anxiety, insomnia, and even memory issues. Um, maca is a root that's found in the Andes. 
And um, studies have shown that it can help with overall energy, mood. Um, it's often used for low libido. Ashwagandha is used both in Ayurvedic and Chinese medicine quite a bit. And, um, you know, a recent double blind placebo controlled study of ashwagandha actually suggested that um, it can impact an individual's resistance towards stress and also his or her self assessed quality of life. Um, it's, it's one of my favorites. Another favorite of mine is this uh, Lavella lavender oil capsules. We've probably heard of lavender oil on the pillow or, you know, as a aromatherapy, but these are actual capsules that you take. And in one study on this particular version of lavender oil, it actually showed that over a period of time, this was as effective as benzodiazepines on generalized anxiety disorder. So I, I recommend this quite a bit to my patients. So some other modalities that can definitely help, um, acupuncture, massage, therapy, these are all available uh, through Sutter. Um, I'm a big fan of all three. I think we can all benefit from, from any and all of those. Um, hydrotherapy, it's a picture of a shower if you can't tell, but <laughs> so hydrotherapy is something that you can actually do in your own shower and over time can help build your, your endurance and resilience. Um, basically doing alternating hot and cold. So three minutes of warm, one minute of cool, as cool as you can tolerate without you know, being tortured. Um, and then back to three minutes of warm, one minute of cool. You can do that three times and kind of end your shower that way if you want. Um, or, you know, take your whole shower during that time and um, always end with cool. And so just to wrap up, because I want to leave a lot of time for questions. We know that stressors are a part of life. If you're living, you're experiencing life events and you're experiencing stressors, but balance is attainable because some people can respond to it in a more resilient way versus having it lead to chronic stress. And that chronic stress can lead to ill health. There are many, many factors that can increase resilience to stress. Some in our control, some not. But addressing our baseline level of anxiety is one factor that we can actually have control over. There are tools that we can use in the moment to reduce our anxiety. And there are also daily habits that we can use or to, we can start doing on a day-to-day -day basis that can help reduce anxiety um, over time and increase our resilience. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, thank you for showing up, uh, letting me talk a little bit about one of my favorite topics. Um, as I said, I'm fairly new to Sutter. I started March 1st. I am seeing patients. I am accepting new patients. Um, I deal with a wide range of issues. I'm here in uh, San Francisco. We also have a store located here that has um, many, many of the uh, supplements that we use on a day-to-day -day basis um, has that lavella that I talked about, the lavender oil. So if you're just in the neighborhood and you want to come by and check it out, feel free. We also have IHH locations at Sacramento, Santa Rosa, and Roseville.